Given the fact that I'm a real World War II aficionado and I love things of the military of that era, I'm absolutely thrilled to be standing beside, and if my military knowledge is correct, I'm standing beside a half-track from 1945. And the fact that the museum has this is incredible. So uh, to tell us more about it, Steve, tell us about this half-track. I well, mean, those guns look frightening. Well, thank you for admiring our, our baby here. We do love her. She's an M16A2 half-track. She was built in 1943 was retrofitted in 1952 and was slated to go to Korea. Now, she never made it to Korea. She ended up staying stateside. But why it's important for, for Fort MacArthur is that in the years between World War II and Korea, nobody knew what air defense was going to be, and so they just parked these guys in, at certain places. Fort MacArthur had an M16 half-track, and so we had to get one so that we could properly interpret the interwar years between World War II and Korea. Just so uh, our viewers know, I know what a half-track means, but as you see, we have huge tires here, and then behind me over here, we have like a tank track. So, Steve, just explain that a little bit more. The idea was is that this track could take heavy loads and could get to places that a normal you know, tired vehicle or wheeled vehicle could not go. And they were very successful, used throughout World War II, used in Korea, and believe it or not, the Israelis, they might even still have some in their inventory. So they've been using them for years. Still today? Still today, yeah. Boy, that shows American workmanship and craftsmanship. It's one of the beauties of collecting this old stuff and preserving them is the fact that the generations of Americans that produced this stuff they made it to last. There's a craftsmanship here that you cannot find today, and it really is a, a work of art. I know our viewers would be fascinated to find out how much, how much does something like this cost, and where on earth do you find it? Well, again, exact cost I can't determine for you, but <laughs> what you can do is get on eBay. Get on eBay and look at that. Look at the Military Vehicles website. Uh, there are a lot of people, private individuals, that are saving these old... Saving them? Yeah, you know, they're destined for the scrap heap. And what they do is they know, in, inside themselves, they know that there's history in every one of these vehicles. And they save them, and they lovingly restore them, and then ultimately they end up in museums, hopefully. But from my knowledge of things military, I would say that this somewhere is maybe between the range of 75,000 and 100? You're in the right range, for sure. Wow. <laughs> I'm also thrilled to be standing, uh, obviously, beside this vehicle, but over here there are two other vehicles. Uh, just briefly and quickly, what are they? The next vehicle over from us is the M3A1 Scout Car, and it's really important to our area, too, because right after Pearl Harbor, the main concern was a Japanese invasion, and these scout cars actually patrolled the beaches, and they were usually an infantry unit, so we're a coast artillery fort, but we had infantry assigned to us, and they use these scout cars to patrol all the way from San Pedro down to Solana Beach and back. I think the other interesting thing is that they're out here and they look in such good condition. They obviously don't remain here. I mean, were they taken from a military garage or, or hangar or something? It's a great question. Most of these things ended up on farms as farm utility equipment. Farm equipment? Sure a tracked vehicle out on a on a, a plowed field the traction you're going to get they were very very reliable but what usually happened is all of the armor was stripped off the guns were removed the radios are gone and so when we find them or when these individuals find them they have to rebuild them and so it's like almost like a puzzle piecing each piece back together and in the process there's a real intellectual challenge and there's a real physical challenge and it's just it's good for the it's good for the body to do this i know that one of the great american generals of world war ii was uh, blood and guts uh, general Patton, and Patton was actually a tank man but um i can sort of see Patton in this vehicle with the guns blazing i'm sure he would like the guns of course his first choice is is a tank and uh, we hope that we can honor his his memory with a tank here at some point but that'll be in the future Palos Verdes Peninsula High School is having a student-created art sale on November 17th from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Items for sale will include hand-blown glass, ceramics, photos, and note cards. 
All proceeds go directly to the Peninsula High's Visual Art Booster Club, which supports the school's art facilities. The sale will be held in the faculty parking lot at the corner of Silver Spur and Hawthorne Boulevard. And if it rains, the sale will be held in room S13. And keeping it local, the Point Vicente Interpretive Center will be hosting the local author's book signing event on November 10th at 11 a.m. through 1 p.m. This event will feature an array of books focused on the unique beauty and history of the Palos Verdes Peninsula. Come meet local authors and have your book signed and receive 10% off all books on the day of the event. Authors include Doug Christie, Bungie Headley, Judith Love Cohen, Ginger Clark, and many more. For more information, you can call 310-377-5370 or go to palosverdes.com slash rpv. And after the event, you can make a day of it by touring the Point Vicente Lighthouse. And finally, are you looking for some new ideas on setting a great table for the holidays? Well, the women of Las Condolistas held their annual Entertaining for Holiday fundraiser where they demonstrate how to set any kind of table on any kind of budget. Liz Brown Swanson joins us with more. I'm here at the fourth annual Entertaining for the Holidays, a beautiful event put on by the women of Las Condolistas. And every year, these women get more creative and have wonderful ideas to help inspire you over the holidays. This is Las Condolistas, one of the major events that we have, fundraising events. And this is called Entertaining for the Holidays. And we have been doing this for the last four years. And then I tell you how excited we are, because this is the time that we make use of our creative juices and we inspire people to do their own entertaining stuff for the holidays right at the comfort of their home. The best tip I have is to mix and match. Um, what ties the table and all the different elements together is the color scheme. So if you get the colors that go together, um, that uh, coordinate with one another, that's why you can mix the plates. If you'll notice a plate from Italy and a plate from England go together because the greens match and the browns match. Um, and if you'll notice, the napkins are not the same as the tablecloth, but the colors coordinate with the colors in the paisley tablecloth and in the arrangement. Um, the use of the colors in the arrangement brings out all the colors in, other, in the other elements on the table. So when I think that something might not quite go with something else, then I stick another flower in <laughs> that ties it all together. One day, my friend and I were in the, the dollar store and we thought, my goodness, you know, you don't have to spend a fortune to have a, a cute table setting. And so we took the challenge and decided that we were gonna decorate a table on any, nothing that cost over a dollar and we stuck to that everything here was a dollar the charger the plate the cup the bowl we took an, a tea towel and full tied it in a knot and made a napkin out of it and the glasses the stemware were actually a dollar our table is frosty the snowman an eve of and we had my, the woman I did this with, Freddie Benson, had these Frosties in her collections. So we made our table with that theme. We only had three, so one of them we had to create a, a melted snowman over on the last plate. I'm Ann Goodhart, and my table is a Christmas table called Dining on Christmas Eve. And all of the, I tried to keep it mostly red and white and silver with a touch of green here and there for Christmas. So it, it's just a lot of fun to gather what you have in all your Christmas decorations and put them all together and make the most elegant Christmas table you can. This is called a New Year's Carnival. It all started with the uh, moving uh, Ferris wheel that was given to me by my uh, Uncle Jack and Aunt Eleanor. And from there, the table was inspired with dishes that have come from um, Pier 1. It's to give you kind of a Mardi Gras feel. Uh, this is something you could do at home very easily. We, uh, most of the pieces have come from either Party World or um, 
just extra fabrics we've had at home for doing tablecloths. As you can see, these women are so creative and what wonderful ideas that are inspiring everyone here to go out and decorate for the holidays. Back to you in the studio. Las Condolistas is an organization that has raised more than a million dollars for children's charities and the environment. For more information on this creative group of women, their website is lascondolistas.org. And that will do it for today. For all of us here at RPV-TV, make it a great day.